First off, if you're new here today, we want to say welcome. My name is Jody. We're glad that you're here with us today. A lot of new faces. Relax, enjoy. This is a laid-back group of folks who love the Lord, and so we hope that you have a good time here this morning. Uh, speaking of good times, there's something that's happening about an hour west of us uh, this morning. Chad and Wesley and Andy and their families are at Mountain View. Only 4% of the churches in America ever plant a new church. And studies show that one of the best ways to reach people is to plant new churches that are committed to evangelism and discipleship. And so Compass South had the vision years ago to plant a church, and so here we are. And in, in our year and a half of being a church, we now have the opportunity to partner with a church in Mountain View. And Chad and Andy and Wesley and their families are over there with them today, praying with them, encouraging them. Chad's going to preach, and it's going to be basically a commissioning service for them and our partnership together. So 4% of churches plant churches. I don't know what percentage of baby churches then plant the grandbaby church, but what an exciting morning it is for us as a church for that to be happening. And so let's take a moment, pray for what we're going to do this morning, and then let's take a moment and we'll pray for uh, Chad as he's preaching probably now over at Mountain View. Father, thank you for this day. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are holy and that you're just and righteous, but we also thank you that you're full of grace and mercy and love. God, thank you that those are not opposite things with you, but they are, they are combined in the perfections of who you are. So we ask that as King of kings and Lord of lords that you will work powerfully in Mountain View today, that you'll use Chad mightily, that you'll anoint him with your Holy Spirit as he teaches your word. I pray that you'll encourage those folks as they begin this work. And God, I pray that even in Mountain View today, what's going to happen will have the seeds of revival in it. We pray for our time here this morning, that Lord, you would come and be among us by your Holy Spirit. And as we open your word, that you'll speak to us. I ask that you'll fill me with your spirit to speak the words that you have for us today. And Father, I pray that as you will find our hearts and cultivate our hearts to be good soil for the seed of your word. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for this time together. And we thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you take your Bible this morning and turn to the book of Philemon? <clears throat> and I told Jamie that when I say that, there's going to be three groups of people here today. There's going to be about 40 of you who know where the book of Philemon is. There's going to be about 40 of you who are the most honest people here who will go to the table of contents in your Bible, and you'll find it. Then the rest of you will try to look spiritual, sorting it out for the next five minutes. So, book of Philemon's in New Te the New Testament. It's a small book we're going to look at today, and we're going to talk about freedom and forgiveness. There are two things that every human being needs, many things, but two of them is we need to forgive and we need to be forgiven. And right now, if you're an average human being, there's somebody that you need to forgive. And there's somebody that needs to forgive you. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to build a table of forgiveness. It's going to have a flat top. We're going to look at that first. Then it's going to have four legs that we're going to put under it to stand it up. And it's the table of forgiveness that we first meet Christ at. And then as we are followers of Christ, it's a table we then invite others to, to forgive them and help seek reconciliation. So find your place there in the book of the New Testament in Philemon, or if you have the Bible app, the, the verses are in the Bible app, you can scan it along with the notes. Now, I'm going to read the whole letter. This is one chapter, it's 25 verses. I'm going to read the whole letter, then we're going to try to break it apart, and we're going to look at these pieces that it's going to take to make this table. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the knowledge of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. We're going to stop right there. Let's think about building this table of forgiveness today. And it's going to have to have a top to rest on. 
And the top that it's going to have to rest on is going to be our commitment to follow Christ. Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said, If any man wishes to come after me, let him do three things. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Those three things are not easy. But following Christ is not easy. It is very simple, but it's not easy. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, here's what it looks like, and here's what you'll have to commit to. In churches in America, we often wonder what we can receive by following Christ. But in the New Testament, it often talks about what it's going to cost us to follow Jesus. And what we're going to see in these passages today is very costly. Now, thankfully, Jesus has paid the costs. So we take this table and we form it first, knowing that the platform that everything's going to, that's going to be held up and rested on is our commitment to following Christ. Because if we're not willing to follow Christ in the manner that he has described there in Luke 9, 23, there's no amount of legs that will hold this table up. That's the thing that you and I have to resolve in our heart and mind is that, that we're going to follow Christ and forgive others as he has forgiven us and then seek forgiveness from others when we have offended them. Forg forgiveness is free, but that does not mean it does not have a cost. So we set the platform for our table with Luke chapter 9, verse 23, our commitment to follow Christ no matter how costly it is. Now, to the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon is a very short book. It's only 25 verses, and we'll work our way through it. We'll do it quickly. But the book of Philemon is Paul's shortest letter. He would write these long letters to churches, and they'd be chapters and chapters. This one's very short. It's very brief. And you'll notice that it's not written to a church like the Ephesian letter or the Thessalonican letter or Colossae. Or, this one is written to a person. And so it's his shortest letter, and it's a very intensely personal letter. The interesting thing about the book of Philemon, it's the only letter that Paul wrote that he does not describe the gospel in it. Now, take that and put a pen in it and hold it till the very end. But Paul never talks about the death of Jesus. He doesn't talk about the resurrection of Jesus. He doesn't articulate the gospel at all. This is the only letter he wrote where he doesn't explicitly describe the gospel. There are three main characters here we're going to be introduced to. We've already been introduced to two of them. First is Paul, the Apostle Paul. You know who he is. Greatest Christian missionary to ever live. Wrote uh, a good part of the New Testament. God used him to write the New Testament. So it's Paul. The next character we find in this account is a man named Onesimus. We'll get to him, or Philemon. We'll get to him in just a minute. And then a slave he had or a bond servant named Onesimus. So all the interaction we're going to see in this letter is from Paul to Philemon about Onesimus. So we see here in the first few verses uh, the greeting. Paul uses this same familiar greeting. He says he calls the people by name that he's writing to, and he says in verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says this in some shape or fashion in every letter that he writes. And you say, why is that there? Because that's the undercurrent of any letter that he writes. Because you see, grace is the basis of our salvation in Christ, and then peace is the result of our salvation in Christ. So what Paul has written here in verse 3 is going to trickle down through the whole letter as we think about forgiveness and freedom. So, the, so we've set our table before us. It's still lying on the ground, the platform, and it's that commitment to follow Christ like he commands us to follow him and for it to be costly. So let's lift up the end of the table, put the first leg under it, and the first leg for you and I to learn to forgive like Christ is found in verses 4 through 7. You'll see that to forgive like Christ requires that we have Christ-like character. Leg number one. We have to raise up the platform of following Christ and commit by putting that leg under it that you and I are going to as best we can by the power of the Holy Spirit and obedience to the Word of God. And we will fail and we are flawed, but our commitment will be that we're going to have Christ-like character. Notice what Paul says about Philemon here. He talks about his character. In verse 4, he talks about his love. He said, Philemon, not only are, are, do I love you, but many others love you. He was a man of love. In verse 5, he talks about his love and his faith for Christ, and then how that spills over onto other 
believers. He was a man of love and he was a man of faith. This passage is talking to us about Philemon's character. Verse 6 has a very interesting, you have to sort of take it apart and play with it and put it back together to see what's going on. And hear what Paul is saying. He's saying that Philemon, not only are you a man of love and a man of love and faith toward Christ, but you're a man of love and faith toward the brothers, and that your faith demonstrates itself through love, but it's also being fueled by your knowledge of all that you are in and all that Christ is for you. So it's the idea of 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 Philemon's faith being effective. The word there for effective is the word energos in Greek. It's, it's the same word we get the word energy from. And, and Paul is saying, Philemon, because of your love and faith in Christ, and as you get to know Christ, that then flows over in the lives of others, and you can be effective as you're growing in Christ. And then he talks about impact in verse 7. He says, For we have great joy and consolation, your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Each of us need encouragement. Each of us have encouragers in our life. And, and the book of Proverbs tells us, blessed are those who water others because they will be watered themselves. The idea is of encouraging and being encouraged. This passage here that, that, that Paul writes, he's using a very vivid image in the original language. He's saying to Philemon, you've refreshed the brothers. That word for refresh is a military term. And it's, it's the term that was used after a long march when an army was allowed to sit down and someone bring them water. Now think about that, what Paul's saying. He's saying, Philemon, here's what you're like. It's like we're all marching and we're all working and we're all serving and we finally get a break. You're the guy that brings us our water. You need somebody that waters you in your life and you need people that you need to water because there are people all around you who are marching and striving and they're going off one side in the ditch and back over in the other and they're trying to figure out and they're struggling and you need to come alongside them and let them sit down and you just water them. I can remember people who have encouraged me from, I can rewind and it's been a long time since I was a kid, but I can look back and still remember teachers and coaches who were Christians who spoke into my life. I can think of people even this week who have encouraged me. Folks, sometimes the difference between a good day and a bad day is you just being encouraged or encouraged someone. And Paul is talking about the character of Philemon here but Philemon's not the hero of the story because what Philemon was demonstrating was he was just reflecting the love and grace that Christ pours into us. So if we're going to set this table up first, the first leg will stand on us. If we're going to offer freedom and forgiveness, the first leg will stand on us having Christ-like character. Let's look at verses 8 through 16. I'll read them pretty quickly. We're going to see two more legs of this table. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 8, we're going to get to some action now. Verse 8, therefore, so Paul has said all these things and now something's coming. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you, Philemon, for my son Onesimus, who I ha whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is, he is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in the chains, in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So we see our second, our, our second table leg here in verses 8 and 9. To forgive like Christ requires that we have Christ-like character, but also to forgive like Christ requires that we commit to Christ-honoring activity. Or Christ honoring action. In verses 8 and 9, Paul says, I've got a job for you, Philemon. I've got something I want you to do, and it's not going to be easy. Paul had the status of an apostle. He was the one who had led Philemon to Christ years ago. And if Paul so chose, he could say, Philemon, I've got something for you to do, and you better do it. He had the right to give him direction as an apostle. But Paul doesn't do that. He appeals to him out of love. So we see what his request is in verses 10 through 16, and we meet the third character to the story. 
we meet Onesimus. Well, who in the world is Onesimus? He, he was a slave or a bond servant that belonged in the household of Philemon. Now, the word Onesimus, there's a play on words here that Paul uses because Onesimus' name, which is very hard to say if you're from the south, Onesimus' name means profitable or useful. And so what has happened is Onesimus, who was a bond servant or a slave for Philemon in his house, and I've included a bit in the notes about slavery in the New Testament. It was common. That doesn't make it right, but you can look into that on your own. But it was common for a slave or a bond servant to live in the house, and they were well taken care of. Well, something happened where Onesimus decided he didn't want to be a servant in the house of Philemon anymore, so he cuts out and runs, which was a crime. We can only infer, but we don't know. But it's likely that Philemon not only cut and run, which broke his agreement with the house of Philemon, but he probably stole something too because he would have not had enough money to make it to where he went. So, so Paul is saying, guess what, Philemon? Guess who I know now? Guess who I have run into? Your bondservant, Onesimus, has run away from you, but here I am in prison in Rome, and I have found him, and I have led him to Christ. Now think about that for a moment. This bond servant who was called useful, who now Philemon would consider useless because he has run away, runs away. Paul's in prison in Rome, and then he runs into Paul somehow. Maybe he ended up in prison too. We don't know. But Paul meets him, and Paul begins to teach him about the gospel and leads him to Christ and then, then begins to disciple him. But rather than hold on to him and say, he can help me and minister to me, and I can send him out to minister folks while I'm in prison for my faith, Philemon, I'm not going to hang on to him. And while he used to be profitable and useful for you, he ran away, and he's useless to you, but he's useful to me. And now because of Christ, I'm sending back to you, and he's very useful and profitable as a brother. You see, not only does it take Christ honoring faith or, or character and Christ honoring action but what's going on here is Paul is taking a risk with Onesimus and he's taking a risk with Philemon and Onesimus is going to take a risk in all this and we see the third leg of the table is for you and I to forgive and offer forgiveness like Christ is that it requires Christ honoring faith the Christian life is simple but it's not easy and it is not without discomfort, and it is not without risk. But we see here the intersection of God's providence and his power and the obedience of Paul and the life of Onesimus coming together. And as Onesimus is now a disciple of Christ, Paul says, I want you to stay with me, but you need to go home. You need to go make this right and serve there. There's a lot of risk involved in this for Onesimus because he was considered a criminal. And as a runaway slave, that news would have gotten out no matter how far he was away. There was a very lucrative business in that day of slave catching. And so if, if Onesimus is going to go back home, he's going to have to avoid these slave catchers. And so as a slave on the run, he would have been considered a criminal because the folks back home didn't know what had happened. They didn't have cell phones or a way to communicate in a timely manner. And so he had also defrauded his boss and if he went back, he would have to repay him what he owed him. And then if his boss had hired somebody in his place, he would have to pay their salary too. So what Paul is asking Onesimus to do is to go back and pay a debt he can't pay. That's going to be a walk of faith. Can you imagine carrying this letter, being Onesimus and carrying this letter and for a couple of weeks walking back home? Knowing that you could be caught by a slave trader? knowing that you're a criminal in the face of everyone you see, knowing that when you get home that Philemon had a couple options, he didn't have to do what Paul said, and he could, he could decide as his owner any choice of punishment he wanted, ranging from a mild offense to having him branded with an F on his forehead, which stood for fugitives, which means runaway slave, or having him executed. Look at the faith that Paul was having in Onesimus through Christ. And look at the faith that Onesimus was having in Christ on behalf of Philemon to go back. Now you see why we open with Luke 9, 23. If you want to follow Jesus, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow him. And that's exactly what Onesimus was going to do all the way back. He was now a brother, and he was useful to Paul, but Paul was sending him by faith. 
he was now a brother and could be profitable in the faith and in serving with Philemon, but it was going to take faith. So as we construct this table, it takes, as we're going to follow Christ and forgive like him, Christ-like character, Christ-honoring action, and now Christ-honoring faith. But the Onesimus that was going back was not the Onesimus who left. What we're going to see now in the last few verses here is this fourth leg of the table. And we're going to see that forgiving like Christ requires Christ's following motivation. So look at the verses here. Paul's going to lay it out in front of Philemon. He says, if then, anytime anyone who's an authority over you like a parent or a boss says, if then, he says, if then you count me as your partner, Philemon, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, and he's implying he does, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand, saying I seal this. Take him back like you would me. If he owes you anything, I'll pay for it. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I love this. Not to mention to you that you owe me, even your own self besides. Folks, if you don't think there's humor in the Bible, go home and reread that. Because Paul's going, I want you to do this out of love, rib poke, but you owe me. (laughs) What he's really saying is, I can pay you for Onesimus because Christ has paid for both of us. And you can forgive him and take him back because Christ has paid for you. There's still a rib, rib poke. Verse 20, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. And this is a, a command. This last part of this verse is a command. Refresh my heart in the Lord. And Paul is saying, Philemon, I'm in prison for Christ. I'm just simply asking you to take your brother, Onesimus. He's now your brother in Christ. Take him back. Take him like you'd take me. Take him like you'd take Christ. If he owes you anything, I'll pay it. And here I'm in prison suffering for my faith and you're free. Would you just do this one thing and refresh my heart? Because there's nothing that thrills the heart of those who are redeemed like seeing someone else redeemed. There's a phrase we can insert in all this in verses 17 down through 20. We can insert the phrase because of Christ. Here's how it goes. 17, he's saying, Philemon, if we're brothers, then take Onesimus back because of Christ. Verse 18, if you're owed anything, charge it to my account because of Christ. This is my personal request. Don't make me make you do it because of Christ. Verse 20, encourage me in Christ because of Christ. Look at verse 21. He says, I have confidence in your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Why? Because of Christ. Verse 22, but meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Paul was in prison. He was praying. The church was praying he would be released gets down to verse 23, and he gives his farewell. He says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, who wrote the book of Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, wrote the book of Luke, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And Paul was saying to Philemon, if you can't find it on your own to do this, Would you just do it through having a Christ-following motivation of doing what you are going to do and what I'm asking you to do because of Christ? And he's saying, Philemon, (laughs) Onesimus can't repay you. Someone else will have to pay his debt, just like Jesus paid my debt, just like he paid your debt. You see, folks, here in these verses, Paul doesn't have to describe the gospel because he's telling them to demonstrate it. Paul doesn't have to describe the gospel because it's all over the pages. And he's saying, I don't want to lecture you on the gospel. I want you to live it out. And Philemon, here's a great opportunity for you to live out the gospel. You've been wronged. The man who wronged you couldn't repay. 
He has run away and done things his own way and failed, but Christ found him. And Christ has turned him around, and Christ has paid his debt. And because of Christ, I want you to treat him like you would treat me and treat him like your brother. Folks, this was revolutionary because slaves weren't treated this way. Can you imagine what it was like when Philemon took Onesimus back and fellow slave owners and wealthy people, and, and Philemon was probably wealthy, when they saw him treating his slave like a brother? Paul's saying, I'm not going to describe the gospel to you, Philemon, because you know it. I just want you to demonstrate it and live it out. So, was there a reunion? What happened? Because you read this and you're like, there's no Philemon chapter 2. What happened? We're not sure. We're not sure about what happened with Paul, but some scholars say and some disagree that Paul was released for a while and did get to go outside of Colossae and be there and go to Philemon's house and be with him and Onesimus. And boy, what a reunion that would have been. Wouldn't you have liked to sit down at the table? At the table of forgiveness and reconciliation with the commitment between the three men being their following Christ as a tabletop and Christ-like character and Christ-honoring action and Christ-honoring faith and Christ-following motivation holding that table up, what would that dinner have been like? Where Onesimus wouldn't have had to serve them. Sounds like a table in the book of Revelation about a banquet and a king of kings and a lord of lords who will serve his servants. Hmm. Sounds like a table and Gospel of John, where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords washed everyone's feet and they had their last supper together and he loved them and encouraged them before he went to die on a cross. It's kind of the same table, isn't it? Because any table that Jesus is at, there's forgiveness and there's freedom. So if you and I want to construct this into our lives and us be Christ like, We'll have to commit to follow Christ. And you and I, if you know Christ as your Savior, we don't need the gospel described to us more. We just need to go demonstrate it. And we'll have to do that with Christ-like character and Christ-like action and Christ-honoring faith and Christ-following motivation like we've seen here. So let's get to some application before we close. <clears throat> how's, this, how's this apply to your life and to mine? What do we do with it? on a Monday. But here's what we do with it. We remember that Onesimus's forgiveness cost Paul something. He had to spend time with him. He had to share his faith with him. He had to disciple him. And he wanted to keep him, but he sent him back. Remember that Onesimus' forgiveness cost Philemon something because he could have got his slave back and he could have punished him and, and worked him even harder, but he didn't. He responded in humility and grace and forgiveness. It cost him something. It probably cost him business and social standing as well. And we have to remember that Onesimus' forgiveness cost for Onesimus something too because he had to take this great risk of leaving Paul and being safe for a while and going all the way back to hand the letter to the man that could have had him killed. But in all that cost, thank goodness that Paul didn't have to pay it and Philemon didn't have to pay it and Onesimus didn't have to pay it because Jesus paid it. All the cost was paid. But obedience to Christ will often appear to us temporarily as costing something. So I have to ask you this morning two questions. Whom do you need to offer reconciliation and forgiveness with? And you know what the next question is. Whom do you need to seek reconciliation and forgiveness from? With, with this book of the Bible and these three men as our model, will you do that this week? Because just as Paul was saying to Philemon, so the scriptures are saying to us, I want you to do this. I'm not going to make you do it, but I want you to do this. Why? Because of verses 17 through 25, because of Christ. We can't say we're Christ followers if we're not Christ-like. Lastly, what will you do this week that will cost you something to demonstrate the gospel? Because following Jesus is simple, but it isn't easy. And it is costly because there will be things we can't do and we'll have to lay things aside. We'll have to focus and prioritize and trust God instead of ourselves. 
But there's someone in your life that needs the gospel demonstrated to, not just told to, not shouted out, but they need the gospel demonstrated to. Here's the picture I want to leave you with in your mind. It's time for us as Christ followers to put down our rocks and slingshots and build tables. It's time for us as the church to put our rocks and our slingshots aside and to build tables. Does the story have a happy ending? Kind of. Fifty years later, after Onesimus became a Christian and went back home, in the year A.D. 110, the emperor, Roman Emperor Trajan was waiting on special cargo. He had called from Rome, not called, he had, he had written, he had texted from Rome and said, what's up? He had texted from Rome uh, to Antioch of, Samaria, of Syria, and he wanted something, and it was being brought to him. And it was being brought with 10 legionnaire Roman guards, and they were guarding this cargo day and night. And they stopped at the, at the port of Smyrna to rest on the way back to Rome. These Roman legionnaires bringing this special cargo to the Roman Emperor Trajan. And the cargo was not a thing, it was a person. And his name was Ignatius. You've heard his name if you've studied any church history. Ignatius of Antioch was one of the great early leaders of the early church in Christianity. He had been a close associate of the Apostle John. And the Apostle John had appointed him as the bishop over all the churches in Antioch. And remember, Antioch is the first place where believers were called Christians. And so here's this man who had lived and served faithfully, and he was now being called to Rome, and Trajan wanted to bring him to Rome and ask him to bow at his feet and declare him God, not Jesus as God. And Ignatius had said no. And so he was being brought with 10 legionnaires of Roman guards to Rome to be executed for his faith. At this stop at Smyrna, road, the word got out that Ignatius was there and what was happening. And great early leaders of the church came to him. Because they knew what was going to happen. Leaders from Ephesus came, and from Trallis, and from Smyrna. And the great leader of the church of that region, region Polycarp, came. To minister to a man on the way to his death. But there was another who came. A man whom Polycarp loved, and a man who Ignatius, the man with the death sentence, loved. And Ignatius wrote of this man, there is no one like him in his love and faith. Bring him to see me. His name was Onesimus. Fifty years after this letter, I'm sorry. This runaway slave who came to Christ through Paul and took the risk of going back and to ask for forgiveness and was restored not only became a great servant of Christ in that house, but throughout the whole region.
And the message I want you to hear out of that, you could talk about the greatness of God and the glory of God and the redemption of God, but it starts with understanding that every one of us are runaway slaves. Some know it, some don't. But all of us are running from something till we come to Christ. It may be shame or guilt or whatever. But until we meet Christ, folks, we're all runaway slaves. And we are like Onesimus was till he was redeemed when he ran away. Useless. But in the hands of the king, through redemption and the lamb, through salvation and the Lord of Lords, Jesus, we go from being runaway slaves who are useless to being useful to the kingdom. And the kind of people that when people are dying, say, bring them to me. If you know Christ today, it's time for us to live in such a way that we build tables and offer reconciliation and freedom to people. And if you don't know Christ as Savior, why don't you quit running away? Just come on 